But what I want to share tonight for a little while is something that's had a lot to do with the end time or with books about the end time. And that's where Jesus made the statement, this generation shall not pass away till all is fulfilled. And I thought we'd just have a little bit of a look at that because that's, that's actually caused some problems. For instance, the biggest selling book, you know, I got a book when I was in the States just before what, the year 2000. I was just looking at it today. And it was, uh, it was, the title of the book was The Y2K Meltdown. Written by a very good Bible teacher in America, but now it's just so funny to read it. You know, it's full of gloom and <laughs> doom and gloom, you know, and all the rest of it. So, um, and the biggest, one of the biggest selling books in America in 1988 had a lot of sales. Was it? I'm sorry, before 1988, it's about it was written probably 86, 87, and it was that Jesus would come in 1988. <clears throat> and um, and of course. Because, you see, a lot of people think, well, okay, so there must be a generation when all these things are going to happen. See what I'm talking about? And so then they try and work out how long a generation is. And then they, then they work out when Israel became a nation in 1948. So then they add the 40 years to 1948, and that's how you get 1988. You understand me? And I don't know what your concept is about this generation, but that's why I just, I just want to give you a, perhaps a different angle on it. And we're going to be looking at the Bible. I believe the Bible angle on it. Because people take that and Jesus made the statement. He said, this generation shall not pass away till all is fulfilled. Yeah. Now, I believe Jesus is not talking about 40 years or how long a generation is. What we've got to identify is, what's the Bible talking about when it uses the phrase, this generation? Amen? Because what Jesus said was this, that this generation which we're going to have to identify it, is going to pass away when all is fulfilled. So I would hope it's not us. Wouldn't you? Amen? Amen? Yeah. In fact, I could put the horse before the cart, if you like, right from the start, and tell you that I believe that this generation that Jesus talked about is a generation that's always been in the world, right the way through. It's not talking about a period of time. It's a phrase that's used in the Bible for the wicked. Now that makes a whole lot of sense. You don't have to try and work out a time period. All Jesus is saying is, like when you come to the seventh trumpet and it is done or it is finished, that's the finish of this generation. And as Jesus said, you know, the wicked will be taken, the righteous will be left. That's what we said at the beginning of when you finally uh, return the tape so you can get them, but they're coming. So, so that's what it's talking about, I believe. But we, we'll look at the Bible, okay? So think of the phrase, because that's the phrase. See, it's interesting studying phrases in the Bible. And that's the phrase Jesus used, a well-known biblical phrase that I believe the Jews would understand when Jesus used the phrase, this generation shall not pass away. He's talking there about a generation of, of the wicked and the evil that's always been in the world since the beginning. But there's going to come a time when all's fulfilled when that generation is going to be finished, there'll be no more wickedness. Isn't that great? Yeah. Satan will be bound up. Hallelujah. Yeah. And there'll be no more evil in the world. Isn't that fantastic? So let's look at that. Let's look at that phrase and see how the Bible identifies it. Remembering, of course, as we started, that Jesus said, as in the days of Noah, so shall it be when the Son of Man comes. So what, did they, what phrase did they use in the days of Noah? Well, we'll go through that. We're going to look at this. This is just a, a mini Bible study tonight on this generation. Okay. I want to read this to you. I want you to listen to the phraseology that's used. You ready? Now, I'm reading, I'm reading Genesis 7, and I'm hoping that this study will really clear up for you the thought on this generation. Now, Genesis 7, 1. You listening? And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Amen? in this generation. Notice the phrase that's used, this generation. The same phrase that Jesus used, and Jesus said that this, this generation not pass away to all is fulfilled. As in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. Okay. It says in, uh, in Numbers 14, 27, how long shall I bear with this evil congregation? Evil congregation. Uh, verse 35, I, have, I the Lord have said, this is Numbers 14, 
Now verse 35, I, the Lord, have said, I'll surely do it unto all this evil congregation. It says in Deuteronomy 1 verse 35, Surely there shall not be one of these men of this evil generation. See the good land, which I swear to give unto your fathers. It's changed it from this evil congregation to this evil generation. Amen? An evil generation. You see, you've got to realize there's two seeds in the world. There's the seed of the righteous and the seed of the wicked. Amen? That's, the, that's all around us. Okay, so we'll re carry on and read on. Uh, okay, Deuteronomy. Now Deuteronomy 32, verse 5. They've corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot. Hallelujah. Don't you like that phrase? Their spot is not the spot of his children. Hallelujah. you got a different spot <laughs> to the ones that have got the spot in the world. Their spots are different to your spots. Amen? Hallelujah. They, yeah, well, that's very interesting. They have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his children. They are a perverse and a crooked generation. A perverse and a crooked generation. In verse uh, 20, And he said, I'll hide my face from them, I will see what their end shall be, for they are a very froward generation. A froward generation. Children whom is no faith. Talking about the word of God in Psalm 12, 7. We're just giving a few thoughts there and then we'll tie it up. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Okay. So what I'm saying is this. That there's a generation of the righteous is the generation of the wicked. Understand me? Okay. So you've got to understand, work out what Jesus is talking about when he says this generation. It says in uh, Psalm 14.5, there, there were they in great fear. <laughs> this is a beautiful verse. Because we're going to talk about that on the Wednesday when I get back. Uh, but it says, there were they in great fear. See, men's hearts will fail them for fear for the things coming on the earth. And as we'll share when we come back, uh, the, uh, the righteous um, will not have any fear. God's going to be glorified in his people. We'll share a bit about that, what happens under the sixth seal when we come back, how there's a half-hour silence in heaven. What's that all about? You know, under the sixth and seventh seal, you have the half-hour silence in heaven. But let's read this whole verse. There were they in great fear. Why? For God is in the generation of the righteous. Isn't that fantastic? God. See, when God is in the generation of the righteous, when he is fully manifested, under that sixth and seventh seal, that's when they're going to say they're going to have great fear for the time of his wrath has come. He says in Psalm 71, 18, Now also, when I'm old and grey-headed, hallelujah, O God, forsake me not until I've showed thy strength unto this generation and thy power to everyone that is to come. Psalm 95, 10, Forty years long was I were grieved with this generation. And said, it's a people that do err in their heart. They have not known my ways. This generation. And this is an interesting one in Proverbs. Proverbs 30, verse 12. There is a generation. And I certainly wouldn't want to be part of this generation. There is a generation, Proverbs 30, 12 says, that are pure in their own eyes. And yet not washed from their filthiness. Amen. And the important thing about us as Christians is to be washed from our filthiness. You know, this is talking about religion and stuff like that. You know, people with a false hope, trusting in man and not trusting in God, trusting in religion, and trusting in the, uh, you know, all the things that go with religion, the regalia and all the stuff. There's a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet not washed from their filthiness. The important thing is to be washed from our filthiness because God says in Revelation, when it's all wrapped up, it says, he that is righteous shall be righteous and he that's filthy shall be filthy. And I think that's the terrible thing about eternity is that when, when you greet that day, it's too late to get clean then, you're going to be filthy forever. And I think that would be a shocking feeling to be filthy and not be able to get clean. But the righteous entirely different. The angel said, who is this great multitude? And the angel said to John, these are those that have washed their robes and made them white in the 
blood of the Lamb. Yes. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And that's how you get rid of your filthiness. Amen. So there is a generation that's pure in their own eyes and yet not washed from their filthiness. Verse 13. Beautiful verses here in Proverbs 30. There is a generation. Oh, how lofty are their eyes. And their eyelids are lifted up. That's a generation full of pride. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> and then verse 14. There is a generation whose teeth are as swords and their jawn teeth as knives to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. That's true. Wicked generation. Corrupt things and finances and the control of the world. There is a generation. It says in Isaiah 53 verse 8, He was taken from prison and from judgment. That's speaking about Jesus. And who shall declare his generation? See, there's a generation of the evil and there's Jesus' generation. Amen. Two different lots. For he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people. Speaking of Jesus, he was stricken. Amen. Jeremiah 8.3 And death shall be chosen rather than life by all the residue of them that remain of this evil family. Evil family. And then it goes on to say in Jeremiah 13.10 This is an evil people which refuse to hear my words. An evil people. See, there's a generation of evil people. Amen. And you know, we've got to save ourselves from that untoward generation. Amen. Amen. That's what it's, that's what it's all about. It's an evil generation. Amen. Listen to this. In Matthew 3, verse 7, Jesus said, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you know why the Sadducees were sad, don't you? Can, you can tell me, can't you say, can't you tell me? <laughs> yeah, because they didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in the resurrection. Sad, you see. Sad, you see. There were, when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees come to the, his baptism, this is John, I'm sorry, and this is what John said. He said unto them, oh, you wonderful group of people. Looks so wonderful up there on the bank of the river. No, he didn't say that. He said, oh, generation of vipers. What, <laughs> what a wonderful man he was. <laughs> he was really trying to influence people, wasn't he? Amen? <laughs> oh, you generation of vipers. But that's how bad it is. They're a generation of vipers. Amen? You can't trust them. There's a snake coming out of their mouth. Oh, generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Jesus talking here in Matthew eleven sixteen, but where until I shall I liken this generation? Okay, and I'm going to show you very clearly a moment in the scripture that this generation is not just talking about the generation that's living then. I'll show you that in a minute in the scripture. You know when Jesus said this generation, he's talking about a generation that's always been in the world. Nothing's changed. The wicked are still wicked. Things are still bad. You know people say, well, you know it's worse today than it used to be. No, it's not. It was shocking. 100 years ago. It was shocking 100 years ago before that. You know, I've read all these old revival preachers and I think I told you about John Wesley telling, saying about cleaning up the toilets. Men have always been filthy. You know, that nothing's changed. It's always been like that. And, uh, and so, and it's getting worse as it was in the days of Noah. Okay. So Jesus said, we're until I like in this generation. In Matthew 12, 39, but he answered said to them, an evil an adulterous generation. Jesus called it an evil <clears throat> and an adulterous generation. In uh, verse 41, the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation. Verse 42, the queen of the south, at Sheba, the queen of Sheba, shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. Verse 45, then he goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be unto this wicked generation. Amen. In, in uh, Matthew 17, 17, Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation. Well, it's getting close to the generation of vipers, isn't it? The faithless and perverse generation. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? But now we come to some interesting things that Jesus said. In verse 34, the verse I start quoted at the beginning of Matthew 24, Verily I say unto you, 
this generation shall not pass till all things be fulfilled. Amen? Till all things be fulfilled. And then he says in verse 36 of Matthew 23, Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. That's 23.36. Now we go to Mark. Mark 8.12. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why doth this generation seek after a sign? For I say unto you, there shall be no sign given unto this generation. Now when he's using those terms there, I trust you clicked in and you understand what I'm driving at. When Jesus uses all those terms, I've just been reading those scriptures about this generation. He's not talking about the righteous. He's talking about the wicked. Because he said they seek a sign. He sighed deep in his spirit and said, why does this generation seek up a sign? That's not the righteous. That's not his disciples. That's not the Christians. That's the non-Christians that he's calling this generation. You understand me? So therefore, it makes sense when you understand that when Jesus said, very saying, you this generation will not pass, which means it will be finished, till all things be fulfilled. You understand what I mean? And we've already dealt in our first part of the study about the wicked shall be taken. In Luke 7.31, and uh, the Lord said, oh, by the way, Mark also says the same thing as Matthew, so I'll read that. Mark 13.30, Very I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all things be done, which is interesting. All things be done, because the seventh trumpet said it is finished, but the seventh vowel, which runs parallel to the trumpet, says it is done. Isn't that interesting? It is done. And here it says in Mark, very I say you that this generation will not pass till all things be done. It is done. Isn't that interesting? And that's when it's going to happen. So it's not, you, know, you don't have to work about it. You don't have to sit and scratch your head and work out how long a generation is. You don't have to worry about that. You know? And I, you know, I don't know what Christians are doing with it now because we're getting sort of past it. You know, you're going to stretch it a bit. And uh, so Matt, Matt, Luke 7.31, the Lord said, Where then shall I like the men of this generation? What are they like? Uh, we're reading Luke now, Luke 11, 29. When the people were gathered thick together, began to say, now this is interesting. This here is a real key. And what Jesus does here in Luke 11 is that he establishes what the generation is. And once he's established what he's talking about, he doesn't have to use that phrase again. He just uses the phrase, this generation. So he's a real good Bible teacher, isn't he? Because what he does, what Jesus does at the beginning of this discourse is that he identifies what he's talking about. So he says, I'm talking about an evil generation. You understand me? And that's what Jesus is talking about when he said this generation. Well, if we add that phrase to it, you'd understand it more. If Jesus had said this evil generation, if Jesus had just said that, they wouldn't be doing all this fuss about trying to work out how long a generation is because it wouldn't fit, would it? But that's really what Jesus means. And so uh, when Jesus establishes that thought, he just uses the term this generation because the people know he's talking there about the wicked. And that's what it is. So I'll show you what I mean here because it's very clear in Luke. So he starts off in Luke by saying, identifying it. Look at this. Uh, and uh, in Luke 11, it's very interesting, this, this particular chapter. And in Luke 11, verse 29, and when the people were gathered thick together, he began to say what? This is an evil generation. They seek a sign, and there shall no be sign given it, but the sign of Jonas the prophet, which Phil was talking about. For as Jonas was a sign in the, under the Nubian night, so shall the Son of Man be to this generation. Now he's using the phrase, this generation. You notice that? Because he's established what it is. You understand me now? So when he said it's an evil generation, we know that this generation is the evil generation. It's clear. Come on, it's clear as crystal. And he says again in verse 31, the queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with the, with the, man, with the man of this generation and condemn them. It's the evil. And again, in verse 32, this is all in Luke 11. The man of Nineveh shall rise up in judgment with this generation shall condemn it. Now we come to the real key, verse 50. That blood, that the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world, the blood of everybody that was killed from Abel right the way through for those thousands of years, Jesus said, may be required of this generation. Now, come on, put your thinking caps on. Jesus is not saying the people that were living then, that would be so unjust and so ridiculous, that the blood of Abel and all the prophets and all those people have been killed for thousands of years would be required of no generation but the one that was alive when Jesus was there? Come on. 
Jesus wasn't talking about that. He's talking about the evil generation that's always been in the world, the seed of the serpent that's always been in the world, the seed of the wicked that's always been in the world, every, one that's been, every righteous man that's been slain, the prophets all down through every generation, got to be required of this generation. You understand me now? Is that clear? It's very clear, isn't it? It'd be absolutely ridiculous for everyone that's ever been killed to require that generation that was living then. So when you read it like that, you can understand it. Read it again. Verse 50, that the blood of all the prophets which were shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. This generation. So once you understand the phrase, this generation, it's talking about the evil. And it will be required of the evil. It will require every evil man that did it. Right down through. They'll all be raised up for the, for the judgment. Yes. In this, but it will be the second resurrection. It will be the resurrection of the unjust. Resurrection without mercy. And then he goes on and tells us how much blood it was, verse 51, from the blood of Abel. So it's sort of inferring that Abel was a prophet. From the blood of Abel, Abel, sorry, under the blood of Zacharias. Isn't that interesting? Abel, Zacharias, A to Z. Isn't that amazing? A to Z. Abel, Zacharias. I don't think that's by chance. A to Z. A to Z in English language. Alpha and Omega. <laughs> Is the first letter, and Omega is the last. Alpha and Omega. Jesus said, I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And here he's popping in, Abel to the blood of Zacharias, which perished between the altar and the temple. Very I say to you, it shall be required of this generation. He's not going to require the blood of Abel that was slain thousands of years before on the Jews that were listening to him preaching there and the generation that was alive then 2,000 years ago. Is it? No, it's the blood of this, the evil generation has always lived as we part of that generation. You understand? You understand that? It's clear, isn't it? And so we, uh, it's still required of this generation. And then he says in uh, Luke 17, 32, but first must he suffer many things and be rejected of his of this of this generation. So now we can understand. As we see here now, even in Luke, it mentions that Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And it's in Luke 21, 32. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away. Ha ha. Uses the phrase here, pass away. That means they're finished with. You know, what do you what, what do you do when, when you use the phrase pass away? You know, you all say, don't you? Oh, so and so passed away. I did hear about Brother So and so he passed away. You know, what a blessing. Sister Mercil passed away. <laughs> but we know what that phrase pass away means, don't we? And this evil generation, praise God, is going to pass away. Amen. Isn't that exciting? Amen. They're going to pass away. It's going to happen. But Jesus said, Verily, in Luke 21, 32, verily saying, This generation not pass away till all be fulfilled. When, when God fulfilled everything, he said, This is it. I'm going to wrap it up. I'm going to rip out the wicked. I'm going to sever the wicked from among the just. You're not going to have that evil generation anymore. Glory to God. God's going to cleanse the earth and prepare it for the millennium. Amen. Amen. Isn't that fantastic? So you know what you need to do, don't you? You need to do what it says in Acts 2, 40. 50, 40. And with many, many other words, this is the Apostle Paul, did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Eh? So when you get, you get a raw deal by the wicked in the world, you can just thank God you're not part of that generation. Amen? You're not part of their spots. Hallelujah. And at all. Amen. Okay, so pass away. We know what that means. And just, just, to, just to say a few more things here I want to say. Now, that Jesus, now, you know, because isn't it, aren't phrases interesting in the Bible? You know, you can really understand the Bible, you just follow the phrases through. And you understand this generation. So it's not a problem to me. All this fuss about trying to work how many years and, you know, when, when it was this and when it was. Forget about it. When it's all fulfilled, then it'll happen. Amen? So there you go. And time proves that. But think of the phrase, pass away, for a moment. Think of the phrase, pass away, because Jesus said in Luke 21, 32, Very low saying to you, this generation shall not pass away till all will be fulfilled. So let's think of that phrase. It says in Job 6, 15, My brethren have dealt deceitfully as a brook, and as a stream of the brooks they pass away. Okay? In Job 34, 20, in a moment shall they die. 
and the people shall be troubled at midnight and pass away. <laughs> so it's quite scriptural for us to say so and so passed away. Because to pass away, it means to die. So, you understand? Yeah, I always used to say to the students, I taught at Hebron Bible College for 10 years, I always used to say to the students, the Bible's its best own interpreter. Let the Bible interpret itself, and it will. And so when we take, get the phrase that Jesus used, this generation not pass away, we look up the meaning of the word pass away, and it means to die. So there's a generation that's going to pass away. Isn't that good news? Hallelujah. And then look at some more. Uh, and in a moment shall they die and pass away, and the mighty shall be taken away without hand. So, uh, so what does that tell you? There's going to be a generation, come on, think about it, there's going to be a generation that will pass away. <laughs> Isn't that good? And you know which one it is. So what is the other generation going to do? Eh? Yeah. So they're not gonna they're not gonna what? They're not gonna pass away. You understand? Amen. So you get, gotta get yourself amongst the right group of people. Yeah. Gotta get in the right camp. Yeah. So let's think about that. Listen to this. Still using that phrase, pass away, look at this. I'll just read it to you. In Daniel 7, and we'll be talking more about Daniel when we come back in uh, a couple of Wednesdays after I get back from New Zealand. But in Daniel 7 14 it says, There was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom this is talking about jesus and his kingdom and all people and nations language should serve him his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not oh, away. <laughs> glory to god his kingdom shall not pass away god's going to shake everything that can be shaken that only that which cannot be shaken will remain Glory to God. That's why God says you're going to see the shaken. You're going to be here. Only with your eyes you behold the destruction of the wicked. But no plague will come nigh thy dwelling. Amen. Amen. The Bible says the same in lots of other places we know. So many places the Bible says that. But, it, but God's got a generation of people that won't pass away. Hallelujah. We shall not die but live and declare. He lifted me up from the gates of death. Hallelujah. And so there's a dominion, there's a, uh, his dominion, his everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, which that which shall not be destroyed. Aren't you glad? Hallelujah. And of course it says in Matthew 5, 18, For very I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or tittle, or no, longer, no, no way pass from the word of God, till it's all fulfilled. And when it's all fulfilled, that'll be it. Okay, remember we, just in closing, we'll just say a few more things about one little thing we picked up. As we're going through the study, we notice that verse in Deuteronomy 32 where it says they've corrupted themselves, speaking of the evil generation, their spot is not the spot of his children. They are a perverse and a crooked generation. You know that God said in, Le in Leviticus 21, 18, whatsoever man he hath a blemish, and a spot, or whatever, he cannot come into the presence of God. you got a spot, you can't come into the presence of God. Amen? Well, we know what we're talking about. It's spiritual spots, sin, spots of sin and so forth. So that's important to realize that our spot won't be the same as their spot. You understand? We'll just close and think about this. What's the man have a blemish? Because Deuteronomy says they've corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his children. Okay? It says that... Uh, in, uh, in uh, Leviticus, uh, verse 21, 21, no man that hath a blemish shall come nigh to God. If he hath a blemish, he cannot come to God. Verse 23, only shall not go into the vow nor come nigh into the altar because he hath a blemish. He cannot come to God's presence because he hath a blemish. It says in, uh, in Job eleven fifteen, for then shalt they lift up thy face without spot. <laughs> Praise God. Yea, thou shalt be steadfast he shall not fear. So the Christian can lift up his face without spot. Hallelujah. But the wicked have got all these spots and stains of their filthiness. Amen. And then it says um, in, uh, oh, don't you love it? In Solomon, Solomon it says in chapter 4, verse 7, Thou art all fair, my love, there is no spot in thee. Hallelujah. Talking about the beloved, talking about our bridegroom, talking about Jesus, Jesus has no spot. Amen. Hallelujah. He has no spot. And when, when we, we're going to be like him. And when we see him, we will be like him. So now we come to a couple of thoughts. We'll close on this spot thing. But it says, um, without spot, uh, 
Uh, Daniel 1, 4, children whom was no blemish. Isn't that interesting? Speaking about Daniel and God's people, they were children whom there was no blemish. No blemish. No spots. Praise God. And then, of course, uh, <clears throat> it says in 1 Timothy 6, 14, Thou shalt keep this commandment without spot. Without spot. 1 Peter 1, 19, But with the precious blood of Christ as the Lamb without blemish and without spot. Jesus had no spots. In 2 Peter 2.13, they shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they count it pleasure to write the daytime. Spots are they and blemishes. Now this is talking about people that are in the church but aren't, aren't, aren't cleansed. And God says there are spots and there are blemishes while they feast with you. They deceived and, and it says, Wherefore, beloved, seeing you look for such things, be ye diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot. God wants us to have no spots. Amen. And then in Jude, talking again about the unrighteous coming to church and never changing, and their lives never changing. Come on. What's Christianity all about? Change. But they don't change. You know, and they don't change. And sometimes it's just a pain in the neck, actually. It goes on forever and ever. I know, because I passed it a long time. And they just don't want to change. And God says, these are spots in your feast of love or charity when they feast with you. Okay? They are spots. And, you know, and, and then in Jude verse 23 it says, others saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted. The garments even spotted by the flesh. And anyway, let's close now. This is the good news, that we can get rid of our spots. Amen? So as the Bible says, they've corrupted themselves in Deuteronomy 32, 5, their spot is not the spot of his children. The spot of his children is perfect, spotless. Hallelujah. But what does God say? The good news is in Ephesians 5, and this all makes sense when you think about the spot and the blemish. You couldn't come to God's presence if you had a blemish. You couldn't come to God's presence if you had the spot. So how are you going to get there? It says in Ephesians 5, 27, that he might present to himself a glorious church, not having spots. Hallelujah. Amen. Not a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, any such thing that should be, be holy and without blemish. Amen. If you had blemish or spots, you couldn't come in. This all makes sense when you look at that, doesn't it? Without blemish. Hallelujah. That's what God's going to do for the church. Amen. Amen. So God bless you. And I, I hope, that, hope that helped you to understand about this generation and what God's doing because this is all to do with the end time too.